perhaps the biggest communication failure was to call it ESG investing because who the heck knows what that is? It, it, you know, an average person who's not involved in this field, almost no one. Um, so the field, when we did our trends report last year, uh, was 8.4 trillion in the United States. It's much larger when you aggregate the numbers of our global uh, colleagues, which we do also every two years. Um, and what we found in the trends report, and very relevant to this conference, is that for both asset managers and institutional investors, the number one issue that they looked at in terms of portfolio construction was climate change and carbon. And you saw a big jump this year, for example, also in workplace-related issues, diversity, equity, and inclusion, better pay, sick leave, the, all the things that came up in the wake of the pandemic. And similarly, you started to see a much bigger focus when interest in issues around police brutality, diversity, equity, and inclusion after the murder of George Floyd. So both of those, and you oftentimes see this in the field when there's a substantial issue happening in the US or globally, and it's not being managed by the policy process in particular, it oftentimes starts to show up in the investment process. Um, and so the strategies are two things. One is shareholder engagement, which some of you may be familiar with, how to you use your ability as a shareholder to influence a company. And the other one is through what we call ESG incorporation. Uh, how do you incorporate ESG into the portfolio construction process? And that has five elements. It could be best in class, right, best in class. Um, it could be negative screening. It could be sustainability themed investing. It could be impact investing. It could be ESG integration. I just want to note that as we talk about things like greenwashing, et cetera, I think uh, it deserves a conversation about ESG integration, which has become such a piece of sustainable investment, but probably the one most likely to get criticized for being too shallow. Can you explain what ESG is? This. Whoa, uh, now the mic is really on. Okay. Just say what it is. Oh, ESG integration. integration is when you basically do some sort of ESG overlay over a fund without saying in great specificity, these are the issues that we look at in particular in a fund. So and presumption that somehow it's being integrated across decision making. Correct. And in the research in particular, right? In the research and data. And so that started to happen in like 2014. And then you just saw almost a ski slope going up of uh, investors who were using ESG integration, where before it used to be negative screening or positive screening. I think that's a, probably enough for an overview. That's good. Yeah. Anything either of you would ask or uh, kind of respond to here? Is that a good starting point of a description of the of the domain? I would say um, we. I think we've already hit on one of the challenges, which is an absence of definition, and this goes back to 2004 when ESG as a concept was created by um, a UN subbody of 18 investors, and they created this report called "Who Cares Wins," and that's where ESG first shows up. And even in that report. Um, they say intentionally they don't want to define the term specifically, and they use a number of different illustrations of what ESG investing might be. It could be a set of criteria for investment. It could be a series of objectives that drive towards sustainable development goals. It could be a way to ensure the um, delivery of the global compact. There's six different reasons that that report calls out one might engage in this kind of behavior. And because it's so well-defined now, we have, as Lisa rightly said, um, wild confusion about what an ESG investment is from my perspective. It's not just the categories that she noted. Also, some people substitute words like sustainable investing and climate tech or sustainable investing and impact or ESG investing and negative screen. It is a mess in terms of what you read, I think, in uh, the press. And why that matters is the estimates of ESG investing, Stanford just put out a report, range from $715 billion to $120 trillion. You know, that would be like asking someone. But that's globally. Of course. Yeah. Okay. okay. But think about that range. It's like asking, you know, three people how big their house is. And one tells you it's uh, 1,000 square feet. Another says it's 1,500 square feet. And another one says it's, you know, a million square feet. There's just absolute order of magnitude delta. How can anything be effective if it's that ill-defined? I'll give you one concrete example, and uh, um, just of how I think messy this is. The largest asset manager in the world is BlackRock. They've been probably the most aggressive in terms of creating ESG funds. They have over 200 ESG funds. 
on April 8th of 2022, they created a fund called the U.S. Global, the U.S. Carbon Readiness Transition Fund, and they raised 1.25 billion dollars in eight hours. It was the largest Amazing. ETF raise ever in that short a period of time. So, Ken, let's go. Let Sorry. me just finish this one thing. Let me sure, go. The, you look at the composition of that fund, and you'd think, as an outsider, that it would include Tesla or Orsted or battery storage companies, etc. Go after this and look at the prospectus. The top holdings are Apple, Facebook, Google, Google, um, Johnson and Johnson. Exxon is a top 10 holding. There's nothing about it that's sustainable. Judy, can I just respond real quick? You may. One, I want to go on the record that I didn't say that ESG space was wildly confusing. Um, <laughs> but I also think can, there are definitions. I mean, there may not be regulatory definitions yet, and that's a conversation I hope we'll have in terms of what the SEC is doing. But US CIF defines what ESG integration is, what all those different strategies are very clearly that's been picked up by virtually every sustainable investment organization globally and by the PRI. So we all share that kind of definition. So I don't think it's fair to say there's no definitions. That's just not true. Are they definitions that people always can uh, put themselves in very clearly? Perhaps not. Um, but there are definitions. There are ways of describing different strategies. What we don't have is, for example, a disclosure regime for funds, which the SEC is working on, that would describe what you have to do if you want to call yourself an integration fund or an impact fund. And we totally support that forward movement. But I don't think it's quite the wild, wild west that you described it as. Although it's, it can be pretty crazy. I mean, I think within the last week, there are new funds that have been, are now in the bio kind of, you know, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, with the new protocol that was just passed around biodiversity, mm -hmm. you know, there are now new funds that are in the biodiversity space. And the commentary I read was, there are now funds that are kind of named that, but there's no real indication that they're actually doing anything that's going to move us forward. I think that's kind of the question that, as consumers, that people will be trying to figure out. Jonathan, let me start with you. Change it up a little bit. Okay. The name of this panel is ESG debate. Does ESG investing help people and planet? Do you have a point of view on that? Do you want to, is that a too broad a question to kind of, let's hear from all of you on it. Does it help? So it is a broad question, <laughs> but I, ha I do have a point of view. And, and yes, of course, of course it helps. I mean, if I were to pull back and say that the paradigm of value has shifted from shareholder value to stakeholder value, I think everybody in this room agrees with that. And then there's a framework that needs to be applied to that paradigm shift that needs to be measurable, uh, that needs to be monitored and understandable and transparent. Uh, and that's where we're all struggling to pot potentially put a definition on it. Uh, the vehicle of capital is an enabler for change and for positive change. Does it have issues? Yes, for sure. But in terms of everybody's positive intent, I believe that the mobility of capital allows these organizations to benefit from that mobility of capital in order to make those changes. Sometimes the rules are unclear. When you say the organization, you're talking about companies. Companies, sorry, yes. Uh, individual companies need to have a clear understanding of what they need to adhere to, what good looks like, in order for them to participate in the, um, the expectations of the consumer, the employees, the broader stakeholder group in general. Uh, and therefore, I, I believe that impact investing is an extremely positive trend because it's not just about making money anymore. It's about a broader definition of value that needs to be more closely defined, more granular in its definition, in order for uh, the, in order for for people to make a decision as to where they want to place the, that capital. Uh, there's two aspects of this. This is the companies individually are going to allocate their capital to what the feedback is from the community, and based on what value is, and value is a collective, and therefore, when so, yeah. so you're saying that you in your from where you sit, you see companies that are actually kind of listening to the retail consumer to try to figure out what their priorities are? 100%. Absolutely. Give us an they, example. Li they listen to their consumers, they listen to their employees. Uh, in terms of a, so a consumer, like a consumer. But, but make, you know, th those are different than listening to a 
ultimate investor. For sure. Listening to their employees is a very different craft than trying to figure out what's going on in the retail investment market. Yeah, for sure. So, um, for example, there is this exploration from companies that understand that their customers are looking for a, a greener product. I'm currently working with a pharmaceutical company um, that is evaluating the fact that they don't require cold chain in their, in their logistics and they want to promote that as a greener product than, the, than its alternatives because all of those alternative products require cold chain in their, in their process. So they, are, they want to promote that because if more market share is developed from that particular product, that would re in turn reduce the market share of their competitors that do require that cold so chain. So listen to their customers. So, yep. Right. Lisa, venture an opinion on whether this is all adding up to something and we're, we're going to move on from there. Yeah, I don't think I would have stayed here 16 years if I didn't think it was adding up to something. I mean, I spent the first part of my career doing domestic social policy and the second part of my career doing human rights and international development. And I came here because when I came here, um, the, the field was called social responsible investing and it really was, the point of it was to make a difference in the world, particularly on climate at that point. Now, the field has changed in so many ways that my members now include sort of all the early adopters who came to the space very much to change the world. And there's still many uh, investors who are starting firms in order to do that across all asset classes, by the way. Um, but also, you've now got folks coming into it for risk and opportunity reasons that looking at ESG issues is very much part of looking at materiality. But we also have a debate right now, you all are probably familiar with it, between materiality, uh, materiality 1.0, what is the impact on a company? And materiality 2.0, what is the impact on society? Right? And I do think that over the next five to 10 years, we will accelerate to getting metrics and other kinds of ways to look at what is the impact on a company of society because that is an increasing, it's almost like we've gone full circle. We started out looking at how, how to impact societies and change the world. We moved into a much more kind of uh, materiality focused conversation, data focused conversation. And now we're kind of getting around to the, we've got a lot of, just, we've got a lot of regimes around data. We've got a lot of, the EU has a whole taxonomy. Now, how are we going to think about the real impact on the world? And I think that that will become a larger conversation in the next five to 10 years. A, a repeat in many ways of 25 where years was, ago, but, but another one. Ken, how about you? And then I want you to take us into the world of the current controversy. But first of all, what's your, can you want to put out a basic thesis here? So um, from my perspective, ESG investing hasn't delivered any impact. It is, uh, if you look at when ESG investing started, right, the numbers appear to be going up, but if you track it versus carbon emissions, carbon emissions are going up faster than, quote, ESG investing. Think about it just logically for a second. What ESG investing does in public equity markets is I sell a stock, you buy a stock, okay? That has no impact on the company, okay? And the companies, as Judy said, are the places where the impact is actually felt. I'll give you another concrete example. I sat for 28 straight quarters next to the CEO and CFO at Timberland. We re reported our quarterly results to Wall Street. We're a public company with Class B shares. A third of the CEO's remarks every quarter for 28 straight quarters, a third of his remarks talked about what would now be called ESG agenda. Then it was called CSR. He never got one question, okay, over seven years on that part of the, the script. And so you have to think about does ESG investing motivate companies to change? And the only way, the only mechanism that you can come up with is that it might lower the cost of capital because a stock would be more attractive, okay? If that's true, then ESG investing actually doesn't deliver alpha because a stock that's more in demand with a lower cost of capital is actually gonna start with a higher price. And so there's lots of misconceptions about it. I just wanna read one thing, which is Henry Fernandez, who is the CEO of MSCI. MSCI is the largest rating company that under, we haven't talked about how ESG Say funds- a little bit more what you mean by rating company. So the way that most ESG funds are created is they package together stocks of companies that are rated by a firm like S&P or ISS or MSCI, et cetera, as A or 
AAA or AA stocks, right? They, so it's a rating system, like you have credit rating system. This is an ESG rating system. And MSCI is the leader. Over 70% of investors use MSCI's ratings. And the founder and CEO of MSCI is Henry Fernandez. And he was recently asked, do you think that uh, consumers, retail consumers, understand what they're buying when they buy an ESG stock? And he said, no, they for sure don't understand that. Fernandez did not, however, attribute any of the confusion to his firm's mission statement to help investors build better portfolios in a better world. So he's telling you that, he, that there's some impact associated with this at the same time that consumers, and he went on to say, institutional investors don't understand what these things are. They asked him why then it's so important, and he said something, I, thought was, I couldn't believe he said this out loud. He said, by the way, we're doing this ESG rating and investing to protect capitalism. Otherwise, government intervention is going to come. Socialist ideas are going to come. Yeah. I mean, I'm not making this up. This is an, a Business Week article. So bef before we move on from this point of kind of some of this kind of underlying controversy here, Ken, starting with you, take us into the other. So I, I like to say at the Aspen Institute, we're not a debating society. We may be debating points, but everybody up here is aiming to the same ends. We actually want to release the extraordinary capacity, global reach and distribution systems, talent, problem-solving skills of the private sector for name your objective, right? That is, we're all heading in that direction. No one is essentially denying that climate is important or anything. But what we have is three people that have very different experiences in terms of how they're going about it and different approaches to what they think will make a difference. But Judy, can I? But in this moment, we're also hearing this anti-woke thing, which I just want to get that also in the room at the same time, because that's also a big, it's taking up a lot of noise in this domain. Lisa, do you want to go first on that? Or I was going to ask yeah, Ken to I'm happy start to, out. I just wanted to just briefly respond to, to, to Ken, because I think you just oversimplified the field just way too much. There certainly are things that the field of sustainable investing, which is a giant field. I mean, there's so many different asset classes involved in this space, from green bonds to the private markets to the public markets. And I don't think there, how many folks in this room work for firms or did work for firms that have done shareholder engagement? How many of you would say that had made no impact? Keep your hand up if you think it made no impact to do that. All the hands went down. So One of them went halfway up. Halfway up. So, But what I'm saying is that if you go back to 1975 and you look at what has happened to try to drive investments and companies towards greater sustainability, and I mean that across the whole ESG spectrum, you simply cannot say there's been no impact. What you might be able to say it is that it hasn't been as deep and as wide as we would like, but there's an entire field of ratings in organizations and investors and retail investors who can go into new platforms that wasn't there 25 years ago. And they do have an opportunity now to invest in really great funds that are doing this work, to invest with wealth managers who actually do this at a very, very successful and meaningful level that they didn't have before. So to say that there's no impact broadly it has made no difference. I, I just don't think that's accurate or fair. But I, it would be fair. Go ahead, John. I was just going to pile on. Um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> pile on. Go ahead. Pile on. I, 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 the, the comments that, that Ken made are, are, are fascinating to me. And I, I guess what I would want to understand deeper is capital mobility is an enabler of behavior. And if capital is not available to help shape and influence behavior, um, I think there's a huge gap in terms of the efficacy of the mission that these companies are undergoing. If they don't have the capital, if they have great intentions, but they don't have the capital in order to employ those intentions, or don't know the rules of the game in order to prove out the, um, the criteria that shows what success looks like, uh, it, it creates a dynamic that is very challenging to navigate. Uh, and therefore, the, the fact, if, if we were to su suggest that, that 
there were no ESG funds or that impact investing was no longer available, uh, what capital is it going to be available to these companies that ultimately would like to engage in well, these in, activities? Well, in, in defense of Ken, who never needs a defender, by the way, I will say that, the, the capital doesn't reach the company. I mean, the stock market is an aftermarket. So, I sell to you, you sold to somebody else, may influence the, the value of the stock price, but they got their money at the IPO. It's not an inflow to the company if the stock price goes up, there, it and it's not an outflow um, of the talk if the stock price goes down. So having been a expert in capital markets for 20 plus years, um, I'm just going to maybe adjust some of those comments. In, inflow inflow of, of, of capital into a stock, a stock appreciation, that falls to your, your retained earnings, uh, to, your, to your equity bottom line. So market value of invested capital is a measure of wealth and growth uh, yeah. for a company that is leverageable from a balance sheet perspective. Uh, that is capital that is available to an organization to deploy. Capital allocation is based on the good allocation of capital uh, and the appreciation of investors to understand how that capital is deployed. So return on investment, uh, market value of invested capital are complete measures of growth and success. So when an, when an investor or an institutional investor decides to spend more money on a particular stock, that actually creates more, more uh, capital for that organization to deploy for whatever purpose they want to deploy. So the idea that there's only a secondary market that is not influencing the, the company, I don't necessarily No, I didn't say it didn't influence the company. I just said it, it doesn't mean cash is flowing into the company. It, it, it is because the um, when you look at the balance sheet, asset and liability plus equity, when equity grows, asset, assets grow commensurately with that, and the asset could have a cash line, it could be a long-term asset line. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, a lot of, of actual growth from a company from, from uh, the exchange of appreciating stock. All right, Ken, back to you. So I'll just add a couple of things. One is... Um, and do take us into the current controversy okay, okay. by the end. First is I, I want to touch on measurement and I want to touch on why this has, from my perspective, grown so much over the 25-year uh, run. In terms of measurement, um, Judy, you started by mentioning that SIF, US SIF, just recast the size of the market. And literally, the recasting was from, I think it was 17 billion to eight and a half billion. Trillion. Oh, I'm sorry. So literally cut it in half from one year to the next, which should tell you something about the quality of the measurement, number one. Number two is, if you want to know why this has grown so much fast from my perspective, it's because of fees. Okay, this because is of what? Fees. fees. Okay, fees on ESG funds are typically on average 30 to 40 percent higher than on traditional funds. And why this is important is because the asset management industry as a whole's margins were compressing. They compressed by 460 basis points, according to BCG, over the prior five years. And so ESG investing, which is traditional investing with the veneer of green, okay, carries higher fees because investors are interested in actually deploying capital in a way that would influence outcomes. It's just I don't think this is the right mechanism to do it. Like Judy said, I would like this not to be the case. Like I hope I'm really wrong, okay, because we do need trillions of dollars of capital deployed to solve social environmental challenges. But if you look at that category of investment called climate transition funding, which I think is legitimate, important, real, essential, okay, this year it topped one trillion dollars. Estimates from McKinsey are that it's got to get to between four and five trillion a year between now and 2030 to get us to anywhere close to a sustainable transition. That is totally different than ESG. And I think people confuse that. Climate transition funds are funds invested in things like EVs and renewables and battery tech and ag tech and things like that that are required to influence a safe transition. And can the typical retail investor get into one of those funds? 
there are impact funds and there are climate tech funds. Those climate tech funds are VC instruments. I think they're hugely important. I think they're, I distinguish them entirely from ESG. It's less than a trillion dollars, way less than a trillion dollars. But yes, I mean, individual investors to the extent they have access. There's people here from like Breakthrough Energy Ventures, amazing work they're doing, okay? Uh, there's a whole series of, and more and more each day, climate tech funds that I'm hugely bullish on. But I distinguish that entirely from ESG. And do you want to just say a word about the current kind of anti-wokeness of all of this? I, I, I think it's political theater, and I'm saddened by it because I think it detracts from the legitimate conversation about the efficacy and impact of ESG. I actually blame the ESG movement in part for it, though, because the absence of definition is what created the space for these red state treasurers to create this brouhaha. And I don't think there's anything legitimate about it. Okay, I think it's bad, I think it's theater, but I don't think it's germane to the point I'm trying to make, which is does ESG investing actually move the needle when it comes to impact or alpha? We haven't talked about alpha, I don't think it delivers alpha either. But in terms of impact, I don't think, it, I don't think it's, there's right. any impact. No, that's pretty clear, doesn't it? Ken, I, I firmly believe if someone gave us Mike Pence's phone number right now who actually started this and we called him up and we said, explain to us we could call him on a conference call right now, what sustainable investment is in three sentences or less, he would have no idea and it has nothing to do with lack of definitions. It has to do with being very concerned about the diminution of the fossil fuel industry, which is why you look at Leonard Leo, who's the funder, the major funder behind this campaign, who stacked the bench from the Federal Society with right-wing judges. I mean, this, is not a, this was not a lack of definitions. This is a political machine looking for a way to stop the transition to a clean climate, period. That started it. Now they're going after several other sort of social issues. To our report, I just want to say really quickly, we do a trends report every two years. I invite you to go look at our website. But what we saw since 2014 is this big, big number on ESG integration. And after our last report, where we felt we were not getting enough specificity around the ESG criteria used, particularly by asset managers, we decided to change our methodology and require much more granular data. And I see this very much in line with the maturation of the industry and the changes in the industry. While that survey was open, the SEC put out its proposed rule on fund disclosure. And what we saw in real time is asset managers reporting to us greatly diminished assets that they considered ESG. So while we had refined our own criteria, asset managers were starting to look at the reality that the SEC was going to give them a rule with much greater clarity about what could be considered ESG. So those numbers fell. And frankly, Ken, I'm really proud of what we did because we knew we would open ourselves up to criticism. But we also know that as an industry, that a, an industry body that's there to both advance the field but also look at the quality of the field, that it was absolutely necessary for us as the field started to grow so much to say, OK, wait a minute. This is how the field actually has to be measured. And once the SEC comes out with their rule, which I hope will be It'll sooner rather than again. later. April. Right. Huh? I, think, I think it's in April. 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 Right. It will, it will provide some guardrails, yeah. I hope. Jonathan, I want to I want to come back to you, and I want to get a couple more ideas on the table, and then we're going to open it up for um, there was comments just, from the there room. There was just and, one comment that I wanted to Sure. Add. And then I'm going to. Yeah, no problem. Then I'm going to. Double come yeah. back to you. Go so, ahead. So, so I, I really um, was fascinated by Ken's comment around the fee structure uh, for the asset managers. And I guess I wonder if the cost of the evaluation of these criteria adds to the fees that, that those asset managers are charging. Because <clears throat> if, if there is a new rubric uh, or framework and it is unclear, uh, it is very broad, the capabilities and the scaling up of the cost for that asset manager to evaluate those criteria, I think is also something that probably needs to be considered when, when, when we do that fee analysis. So the, you're, you're putting on the table that basically maybe their costs are higher and that's why their fees have to be higher. That's right. Because it's more complicated what they have to do. And and, and there and there is, I, I mean, Lisa, I appreciate that there is definition, but you know, Ken's making a, a pretty strong point around that there's work to be done in Absolutely. that space. And I, I I'm totally sure. agree. So, yeah. That's why so totally I want to go, this. before we go back to funds and the capital markets piece, I would like to go for a couple of minutes deeper into your work sure. at Deloitte. No problem. Because you're actually advising companies on this. So take us into a little bit your, the way you think about useful data and information 
and targets and measurement, when you're actually advising a company, forget about the capital markets for a minute, what does that look like? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it, it can be a lot of different things to a lot of different companies. Can you guys hear him? Oh, it can be a lot of different things to a lot of different companies. Um, I, I'll, I'll go with use cases primarily. Yeah, give us an example. So, for example, worked with a gas utility company that was looking to decarbonize its company. Uh, they were looking really at setting a target that they felt comfortable setting. Uh, they are they have growth aspirations. They want to grow their revenue. Uh, all companies do. Uh, they also want to decarbonize, and, and ultimately they needed a trade-off between being able to grow their revenue line and decarbonize their business. They set across a roadmap in terms of like what, what projects would ultimately be available to them in order to reduce the carbon intensity of their business, to give them confidence that they can set a target by a particular date. They came up with a catchy 30 by 30, 30% reduction in intensity by 2030. Um, a lot of companies are now doing this, uh, something very similar. Uh, they are developing a, very granular on the ground roadmaps. The gas utility in this example was evaluating whether they should electrify the pipeline, whether they should use heat capture technology, whether they should use their traditional offset uh, portfolio in order to decarbonize and how effective they can act, create the biggest impact in decarbonizing their business and what capital cost it was going to, to, to be to, to deliver on that, that target. So being able to help them stress test uh, understand all of the projects that were available to them was one, one example of how a company is looking to really evaluate the um, confidence before they actually disclose to the public what their commitment is. S some companies disclose something and then they turn around and go, oh my God, how are we going to get there? And then they start working backwards in terms of developing their entire roadmaps in order to achieve that decarbonization goal. And then broadly speaking, there are, my background, <clears throat> my background is in, in very quantitative and in decision science. In decision science, there's something called multi-attributes. And when you start looking at trade-offs of multiple considerations, so ESG falls really nicely into that because there are several different um, considerations and objectives that an organization wants to achieve. So we typically start there in terms of what is the mission statement of an organization. Then you translate that mission statement into their objectives that are mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. Then we apply a series of value drivers to those objectives so that they are bite-sized. For example, uh, job growth, um, impact to indigenous communities, uh, revenue growth, uh, profitability, I mean, they, they're all on the table in terms of what that, what that framework should look like. And then what metrics can help you measure how far you can push on those value drivers to show success and then ultimately monitor. And then you go through a data exercise in terms of what data is available, where should we start, and where are the gaps in terms of what data is not available? What right. proxies should we develop in order to, to so, move forward? So very different than what we're talking about in capital markets. So one of my favorite quotes is on above my desk at home from a guy named Jerry Mueller who wrote a book called The Tyranny of Metrics. And the quote is something like this. We're better off with metrics that help us diagnose and analyze than reward or punish. So if you're inside a company, what you're talking about is setting goals, and then how do we know we're actually getting closer? I mean, what, what are the kind of steps along the way? If you think about when you're advising someone, however, in terms of the investor relations piece of this, speaking not to consumers, not to employees, but speaking to the ultimate kind of investor, does this translate? Is there a metric that you end up elevating when you're advising a company on what they should disclose to capital markets here? I mean, it seems like these are two different things, is what I'm trying to say. They, they are, but they're connected. What I, what I would argue is that the investor community, institutional retail, retail represents consumers, the institution represents the institutional money and the capital deployment available. They are going to help drive behavior 
and define strategy. Any good company is going to understand the feedback loop between what capital is available to them and, and their behaviors in order to get rewarded for, for that capital. Therefore, they're going to shape their strategy to ultimately reflect what the community wants. Therefore, the, the metrics that a lot of organizations start developing is, well, what is our strategic intent? How do we translate that, that strategy? How do we measure that strategy? How do we monitor that strategy? And then how do we communicate how we've been successful? How do we define right. success measures? And then, and then it, communicate that along the way. In a world of no constraints, is there anything you would change about this conversation about metrics? Yes, I would say that data is a critical element of metrics, and it shouldn't necessarily be um, the overwhelming factor for not moving forward with calculating information. Um, a lot of times, a lot of companies will say to me, we don't have the data, so we can't do it. And what I would argue is, let's see what we can do and then create an aspirational roadmap for what data we should be collecting for the future. Because all you have to do is take a baby step forward in terms of what data what data you have, what metrics you've already defined, let's just start there and then create that aspirational roadmap. I so agree so, with that because the favorite conversation in the sustainable investment field is we don't have the perfect data. Like this has been going on for at least a decade, but we have so much more data than we did 12 years ago, right? 100%. And so it is this, it, but it is a consistent conversation. So let me Judy, open it up to all of Can I just ask one question on sure. data if we're talking about it? Yep. If we pick one measure that we can measure, which is carbon emissions, some of these things like yep. biodiversity are hard to measure, yeah. but we can measure carbon emissions, and we know it's existential. And we've been reporting on this. The first CSR report came out in 2001. So we've been reporting on this for 20 plus years. CDP is a great repository of public company information. Carbon Disclosure Project. On uh, emissions. So we're 20 plus years in, and we're just talking about public companies. They just reported that less than 1% of reporting companies on carbon have credible net zero plans. Okay, they also what reported percent? less than one. Okay, these are public companies that are reporting to CDP, so it's the best right. of the ones reporting. They, uh, less than 25% of companies report on their full scopes of emissions, scope one, two, and three, and oftentimes scope three is the biggest, which most companies today, public, forget private ones, don't even measure. Mm -hmm. So if ESG investing, was such a lever, okay, in terms of behavior change, why is it we don't even know what carbon emissions are from public companies? We don't today. And I believe the only way to get there is regulation, right? But e thinking that ESG is getting us there, I think creates false hope. That's what worries me. What about the example of Engine One yesterday? How do you think about that in the context of ESG investing? So, um, e Engine Number One influenced a vote at Exxon and got three directors you know, thrown out and three directors put in. That's, by the way, three of 14. Okay, so it's not a majority. We don't know how they're going to vote on anything. And if you look at their capital allocation plan, Exxon, today, fossil fuel versus renewable energy, fossil fuel still more than 95% of their capital allocation plan. So while everyone's excited about engine number one, okay, and you talk about capital allocation, Exxon stocks only ramped up, okay, since the beginning of the Ukraine war. There's not behavior change yet that's manifest. But, Judy, I would also say, you know, this conversation, and I think Ken and I do agree on the need for regulation and, and, sta and standard setting by the U.S. government to go along with many of the other governments in the world. But, for example, the climate change disclosure rule that's pending at the SEC has scope three. And Gary Gensler has said he's... Well, I don't know if he said it, but there have been attributed to commissioners in the SEC that scope three may not make it out um, because they know they're going to be sued. And that is the political environment so we work in. So do you in. want to define scope three for the room? Oh, God. Do you want to define it? You probably do a better Actually, job than me. Actually, we have the architect of scope three in the room, so yeah. she can do it. But I'll tell you, scope, scope one is kind of emissions within your company, so your refrigeration, driving to work, that kind of stuff. Scope, scope two is purchased electricity. Scope three is everything else. It's 15 categories of upstream and downstream yes. emissions. Right. Upstream and downstream meaning what's the impact of your product? Yes. Upstream, what are the suppliers and producers that you depend on? What's their footprint? By the way, I should say that one of the principal lobbying efforts efforts against reporting scope three is coming from the asset management industry. Say that again. <laughs> An asset management industry trade group is lobbying 
the SEC to remove scope three right. from reporting. Um, and we could get into Europe, we could get into all kinds of things here. I'm just going to, what would the two of you, I asked Jonathan, in a world of no constraints, what would you change about metrics? And then we're going to open it up to the room. So um, Cynthia Cummins is here from, uh, who created the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Um, I'm a big fan. It's frightening thinking what you guys all know in this room. We're going to find <laughs> out real quick. Um, and so I'm working on a piece of legislation in New York State called the New York Fashion Act. It does a lot of things, but one thing it does is it says that companies have to sign up and be approved for science-based targets if their revenues are greater than $100 million and they choose to sell in the state of New York. And that means they have to reduce their absolute emissions, independent of growth, by 4 to 5 percent a year. And if they don't, the attorney general in the state has the ability to fine them 2 percent of revenue. So a company like Timberland, there'll be a $35 million fine. So I think you need regulation that has teeth and not just ask people to report or do their best to report. And it's not that the people aren't good people. They are. It's just they're busy and they have other pressures and other incentives. And so unless you mandate it, it won't happen. Yeah, and, and I would just say very simply, there's been, a, there's been a little bit of a graph going around LinkedIn. I don't know if you've all seen it with all the different measuring data organizations that make up the ESG space, and it's giant. And I think one of the reasons we at USF have been supporting more regulatory, uh, more regulations coming out of the SEC is to simplify to a degree what people need to report on and to make sure that we do have data that's comparable. We submitted a petition to the SEC in 2008 asking for broad ESG disclosure standards. We have a few ESG disclosure standards that came out of Dodd-Frank. That's pretty much been it. We're still waiting for human capital disclosure. We're still waiting for uh, carbon, the, the greenhouse gas emissions disclosure. Um, and we're still waiting for the fund disclosure. All of those things will make a massive difference because an investor will be able to go in and see how does a company report similarly on similar things. And we are missing that because we have a whole bunch of different reporting standards but not a singular one in the U.S. that you are required so to do. So this, I'm going to put out one question before we take the. I see Suze has got the mic, so she's coming next. But uh, Paul D'Onofrio, vice chairman of Bank of America, on the main stage last night, said we need universal, globe, like globally reliable uh, disclosure that is trustworthy. And by trustworthy, he went on to define it as being both measurable and material. Is that a possibility that across the entire um, range of market, industry, uh, what's material here is not material over there? Is, it, is that vision he put out last night, does that make sense? So I can tell you there's an effort going on to make this happen, the ISSB, yeah. which is part, uh, but, but the U.S. is not part of this deal, okay? And so we're part of the world, a big part of the world. The rest of the world is actually moving towards a common set of standards, but I want to caution everyone, and I know this will be wildly unpopular. Uh, That's why you're here, Ken. Okay, that, that there's a difference between reporting and disclosure and a difference between disclosure and change. Yes. And so, so much of the energy in this movement has been focused on measurement, and yet we haven't gotten to measurement yet full measurement, but that doesn't ensure that anything's going to change. Think about it. When you go to Starbucks and you see a scone that's 450 calories and a bagel that's 150, they don't choose to put that out themselves. Okay, that's because of regulation. That's forced disclosure to get to at obesity. It hasn't worked. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it won't help. I just help. want one scone, though. <laughs> All right, back to you. Lisa and then Jonathan and then we're going to you, Suze. Um, quick reaction. Is it feasible, the vision he put out last night? You could end up with one universal standard across well, all markets. that is what ISSB is trying to do. Okay. Jonathan? And they've been criticized for not being, doing enough on sort of, um, sort of what would be seen as uh, 2.0, materiality 2.0. It's very much a materiality 1.0 focus. Materiality, in other words, what, yes. what, what matters the most? What's actually measurable? What really matters? Jonathan? Yeah. Is it, within your, is it in the vision that it, we can end up with one standard globally? It, it's a great aspiration. It's a great aspiration. I, yeah. Suze, <laughs> introduce yourself, please. Suze McCormick. Um, it, really interesting. I, I, it's, um, I wanted to tee Suze off McCormick of McCormick is a lawyer who works a lot on design of corporations. 
Okay, Judy. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Judy Samuelson fan girl. Um, and Lisa gotcha. as well. Um, so, Lisa, you, in, you mentioned we actually sort of materiality 1.0, 2.0 out in the field. We're actually, we call it single and double materiality. Exactly. And it, it actually explains a lot of the anti-woke. You've got a lot of it that's climate-based. But if you go to double materiality, that are, there's a lot that doesn't drive alpha. My, my issue and question is you do have now two arising sets of regulations, one in the U.S., which even if the SEC rules pass, are single materiality, disclosure on down, FTC, DOJ, and you've got the EU and the rest of the world that is embracing regulatorily double materiality. And that's a huge issue for companies. And the second thing, I wanted to go back to Ken, who has mentioned Alpha, and I feel like Pavlov's dog several times. Um, You've talked about consumers, you've talked about companies, you've talked about asset managers, you have not talked about asset owners. And ESG at the asset owner level understanding with the shareholder commons that for climate, if individual companies drive for alpha, all of their returns will be reduced. So, and so that, I just wanted to, I wanted Sue's Ken to react to that. Describe what an asset owner is versus an asset manager, please. They're the people with the actual money, not the managers who are making all their money. I agree with Ken on the ESG, ESG fees. So individuals, foundations, foundations, pension yeah, funds, exactly. institutional, Family. large institutional investors, yeah. not the people who are taking the money from them, putting yes. it in funds, paying themselves hundreds of millions of dollars of carry and deploying the capital and making fees on ESG. Each of us. How do you really feel, Suze? I just want to make sure we got that. <laughs> um, question, comment, reaction. So one comment, if you do want to talk about alpha for a second, which is Judy said is market outperformance. One of the theses that are, that's peddled by uh, ESG funds, asset managers, is that if you invest in these ESG funds, you'll make more money than a traditional fund. And the research that's most cited to back that up was a report done by a Harvard professor that says there's actually 600 basis points of outperformance available for anyone in the asset industry. You know, 10 basis points would be a lot. 600 incredible by focusing on material ESG factors when investing. Okay, There's a paper that just came out that actually deconstructed the original paper that George put out and it looked at this thing called the Garden of Fork Paths, meaning when you make, do any research, you're making choices along the way about what time period, what data set, how to clean the data set, etc. There were 400 potential paths that the researchers could have chosen and so these other researchers looked at all 400 and they found out that the original result that these other researchers found adhered in less than 2% of the cases and then if you look at all 400 average returns were actually negative relative to traditional funds so what does that say what do you what what do you say it to says people that to in me this room? look another example which is probably simpler is Vanguard's largest ESG fund is 0.9984 correlated with the S&P 500 that means they're investing in the same thing as the S&P 500. You're not going to beat the S&P 500 if you're 0.9984 correlated. What does it mean? It means that I don't think ultimately investors will be well served by paying higher fees to invest in ESG funds. Okay. Judy, we shouldn't be driving for alpha. We yeah. have to stop. If we're actually going to combat climate change before I'm dead. Oh, I, I totally agree with you, but that's not what asset managers are promoting. I know, but asset owners can take that up. Judy, can we talk about it's an interesting question of design, how asset owners could take that up if, in fact, that's the end game. Lisa? Judy, I just think it's important to go back to that, the, this pushback because we didn't get into it very far. And I just, for those of you who maybe haven't been following the pushback to ESG and now the pushback to the pushback on ESG, Institutional Investor this last week did a really good article kind of looking at what's happened and so this is kind of mostly in red states, including the state of Florida, which is among the worst on this, um, and abortion limitations after six weeks, and the banning books, and I could go on about the state of Florida. Um, but, uh, and being here, and, and something maybe we want to all consider going forward is, and this is no, this is no uh, direct uh, critique of Aspen, but all of us, I think, need to start looking at these sorts of issues as we decide where to put our resources. Um, red states, uh, controllers, treasurers, and attorney generals in some cases have been using different strategies to try to ban ESG investing, to take it out of pension funds, to take it out of uh, other funds that are in the state treasury. And um, it has been, it, as we've talked about, it's been driven by largely very conservative sets of donors. So just so you know, in the last several weeks, Kansas, 
West Virginia, Indiana, Kentucky, and North Dakota, none of these considered to be progressive states politically, have pushed back against the pushback for a bunch of reasons I won't get into here because I take the next half hour. But they're basically saying this is a bad decision and a violation of fiduciary duty. In other and, words, they're saying you should be able to consider these things. Right. In fact, and that's, your pension here may be doing worse if exactly. you limit it. And yes. in fact, the DOL rule on ERISA governed plans that says you may consider, believe me, there are a lot of people who would like it to say you must consider. All right. Let's but get, let's may get. is different, and that's being, they're being sued on that. Can, can I just, uh, I yeah. just wanted to um, address the alpha comment. Um, the alpha question. I know it wasn't directed at me, but I do have a bit of a point of view on that. Um, alpha in funds is theoretically very, very challenging to, to achieve, with, whether it's an ESG fund or not. Uh, and the asset owners, depending on their level of sophistication, have other tools to measure what success would look like. I would argue that the trainer ratio uh, might be a better measure of success, which is return for a unit of risk uh, and being able to understand those risks uh, based on the market overall. So just wanted to, to throw that out there that the paradigm of, of alpha um, in just market theory uh, is more achievable in the impact funds that Ken was describing that were the um, uh, the, the 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 clean tech. I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did I? Maybe I missed your question, then. That's okay. We'll take that one outside. Let's get this other next question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Matthew Lee, MSCI ESG Research. Um, I do want to say we're the first ratings agency to post our methodology public. So mm -hmm. anybody that wants to learn more, you can go on our website and read it now. But I do have a question. Um, I think this is really interesting to say climate and ESG being separate. Um, I wanted to get the reaction of the panel to the merits of that approach as well as the risks, right? Separate, just say uh, yeah, so I think uh, Professor Pucker raised that we might need to have funds specifically for climate investing to optimize climate goals. And I wonder, given that at this panel we've heard, uh, at Aspen, we've heard so much about you know social risks and other environmental risks that come with trying to extract more minerals and whatnot, would that be something that we might miss and a more riskier behavior if we use climate exclusive funds? So, Ken, can yeah. you, does it, I, I wasn't. The Economist came out with a piece, it was 40 pages long, looking at ESG investing, and their recommendation was actually to do what you're suggesting, which is split the E off from the S from the G and create funds that way. I'm not talking about that. When I talk about climate transition funds, I'm talking about instruments that are more like blended finance, okay? and you know, public-private partnerships and climate tech investing. If someone wants to start a fund that's a climate fund, no problem. They should just make sure that the equities held in that fund are legitimate equities that are about addressing climate change. Okay. Uh, right here, please. And then you're going to pass the mic forward. And I We've see another question. hand yeah, up. Back here. Please, you're next. Um, so my name is Andres Duran. I'm from Rutgers University, and I do a lot of research <laughs> specifically on incentivizing the climate change movement. And I think that there's a population of individuals that believe that it's sustainability versus capitalism and that capitalism is why we are where we are today. Um, that leads me to my question of, do you, you know, in this debate, would you say that people are missing the value proposition of ESG? It's not necessarily about ESG, but the value that it can bring to economies across the world sustainably. Do you follow the question? I, I, maybe I could just take this from a retail perspective in a way because, um, oh, sorry. Um, it, and that's that uh, one of my little pet peeves is. Her decide who's asking a question. She was supposed to give it to you. What? Well, He's Judy. Next. Right. So am I supposed to be answering or no? Yes. Okay. Um, I think most Americans are financially illiterate. I mean, you get out of high school, there are very few states that require even like a three-week course on the difference between a stock and a bond and how to create a budget. I know I had to teach my kids, myself, on basic financial things. And so when you start to think about how 
a person who's not involved in financial services or doesn't know somebody who is and probably doesn't look at their retirement plan once they set it for the next 20 years. They know so little about financial services. And let us be clear, the financial services industry speaks in the most obfuscating language possible so that you cannot understand what they are saying. And at every one of my conferences, they say, please speak in plain English. It would help people understand what you do. So you add sustainable investment on top of that. It doesn't make it more complicated, but it just means that you're taking a basic level of not understanding finance because you've never been taught it and adding another level. So of course I think sustainable investing adds value. I just think that for a lot of people, they don't have a very good entree point into the financial services industry, let alone this field, and we should think about that. So. Thank you guys for, thank you guys for such an interesting panel. It's been maybe one of my favorites because we've had such conflicting ideas here. Um, it seems like you all have had very successful careers. I'm guessing maybe you own an asset or two. How do you think about ESG within your own personal investment strategies? Or don't? I don't. So that's, uh, let me just start with that. I don't think, personally, I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm an indexer, right? It doesn't make much difference, is where I would say. Does Aspen have sustainable funds in your retirement plan? I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, yes, we do, actually. You do? Yes, okay. we do. We have two. Go ahead. Quick, quick answers um, to how you think about it personally. So when it comes to money in Deloitte, it's really complicated. So I'm precluded from a lot of different investments. Um, so. Good, <laughs> bad investments? Or uh, just keep going? <laughs> 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 yeah, there's yeah. just a lot of independence issues. So I'm, I, I don't necessarily. Yeah, I'm an indexer yeah. as well. Yeah, there's. Personally. Sure. So. Our, our retirement plan at USF is in Social K. We have a lot of uh, sustainable investment options in there to choose from. I also look at things like C Note, other community type of investments to put my money, credit unions and community banks um, that do work all over the country, indigenous communities, rural, urban. Um, and then I, when I invest in stocks individually, I'm looking at for at companies that are, you know, hopefully best in class to the degree that you can figure it out using Morningstar and other things. Yeah. I'm like Judy, I believe in indexes and low fees, and then when I make personal investments, I invest in companies that uh, are private companies that are working on solutions with primary capital. Felicia, you've got the mic. Yeah, and this is actually a related question. So I work at the Aspen Institute, but wearing my hat as an individual investor in retirement funds, um, I don't have access to a pension. It seems to me a lot of the way that we're relying on impact and ESG investing is through the proxy voting process, the shareholder voting process, but um, so many of these funds that individual investors have access to don't have different voting guidelines. I only know of the vote ETF by engine number one that does. And so many of the indexers, um, like Vanguard in particular, votes against climate resolutions 80 to 90% of the time. So I'm just wondering, you know, as an individual investor, how should I think about the impact that I can have? This is a great ending question, and we will come back to it as we, as we pause to exit the room. Any other advice on that? Do you want to try, does anybody want to try to answer Felicia's specific question? So I can say that Vanguard and BlackRock, uh, I think State Street also are coming up with ways that you can literally vote, mm -hmm. not through advisors, but individuals can vote. Well, if you think that individual investors aren't financially literate, it's yeah. not going to have a much of an impact. I yeah, will also say, many. no, I agree yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 um, the, it's not just, by the way, Vanguard. BlackRock, too, you know, I think 80% of their votes from ESG funds were against ESG resolutions. Hi there, thank you. Alex Reich, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. So Ken, you were talking about climate transition funding, and a lot of what we've heard is you know, we need two or three times as much funding for decarbonization per year as we've ever had for the next eight, 28, or beyond years. And there's just a massive lack of capital for that. And ignoring the sort of, we need to figure out transmission, and we need to figure out all, you know, a lot of these other technical things, if ESG, is, as you've described, not necessarily getting us there, and this kind of mobilizing capital to facilitate 
this climate transition or transformation, as the Bank of America fellow said yesterday, is what we need. Yet that's not necessarily accessible to people unless you have you know an extra five hundred thousand dollars you can park in some you know impact fund and you know pensions and other things that um, individual investors are not able to or don't have the financial literacy to participate in are not going to get us there. Is there some barrier that can be broken down, and if so, what is that to facilitate broader participation in funding the transition or transformation that's necessary? Well, I think in the in a panel next door that was excellent on plastic, someone made a distinction between consumers and citizens, and I think the answer is citizenry. Okay, look at what this administration has done. Inflation Reduction Act alone. Okay, removal of the president of the World Bank. Okay, to force more blended finance on climate. That's the most impactful thing that's happened on climate in my lifetime, is as a result of the shift in administrations and having an administration that actually acknowledges science, and that's where I would put my energy. How would that translate? Vote? Yeah, no, no, vote and convince others. I mean, this is an important, I mean, it's an existential issue. And so to me, that's the highest leverage point. And states, states can do a lot on this as well. So push good governors, good people to run the environmental agencies, things like that. Lisa, in a world of complexity here, what do you advise people in this room as investors? Um, educate yourself. I mean, that, that's where I would start. I mean, we've got a website that's got all of our members uh, listed in their funds. We, we have a website that talks about the different ways to uh, a retail investment guide. It's free. We also have a course, 30 Minutes for Retail Investors, to introduce the field. So I would take advantage of these free opportunities to just educate yourself and go from there. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach to anyone in the room, but I think to understand that there are accessible options for all of you in different asset classes that will move you along a climate or broader ESG spectrum um, and just start that journey if you haven't already. And, and ask your employer, why don't we have any sustainable funds in our plan if you don't? And look at that. How many of you actually know what's in your retirement plan at work? Right. Find out. Jonathan, advice for people in this room? Yeah, no, no, no both great pieces of advice. I, I concur. I, I think being informed, educating yourself, uh, using that education to make informed decisions and vote, I think are probably the best ways to influence the future. 